Thank you for watching Friendship Community Church Sermons on Demand. We're pleased you have decided to view our pulpit messages. Our Sermons on Demand are a ministry of Friendship Community Church and are provided as a resource to anyone who desires to study the Word of God. So open your Bible and get ready to dig into the Word of God and see what God has for you today. to talk to you about five facts we can all agree on. And when I mean we can all agree on, I mean all of us, not just Christians. Every year at Easter time, the liberal scholarly world goes after Christians who believe in the resurrection of Jesus, who believe in the bodily resurrection of a man who was dead on the cross the liberal scholarly world begins to attack us and say that that's not in fact what happened. David Hume, a, an 18th century philosopher and atheist, argued against any kind of miracle. David Hume is a, uh, was a great atheist, a great atheist, atheistic philosopher, and he said, miracles don't occur. They don't happen. When weighing up the evidence for a miracle, one has to consider which was more probable. That a person would lie or that a given miracle would take place. What's more probable? That people would lie or that a miracle would actually occur. David Hume was just one of the voices speaking out against miracles by a God who is transcendent of time and space. One who, who created time and space. I saw somebody posted on Facebook last night, what was God doing before he created? What did he do all that time? And my first instinct was, there was no time. Now, just try to wrap your head around that for a little bit. And, and, and those that are like David Hume that are so in touch with the physical that they discount anything that is extraordinary, anything that is outside of that physical world they can see and touch. Led by Satan, I believe, to discount the word of God and to discount what has historical weight. One of the men that I studied a great deal in my uh, doctoral studies, Dr. Gary Habermas, you see him here, spent much of his professional career in the study of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He wrote his doctoral dissertation at the university, uh, or I'm sorry, Eastern, Michigan State University, that's it, Michigan State University. He wrote his doctoral dissertation on the minimalist approach to the resurrection of Jesus. Essentially, in Dr. Habermas's study, he developed a minimal set of facts that can be agreed upon by almost everyone concerning the resurrection of Jesus. Now, lest you think that Michigan State University is a Christian school, it is one of the leading atheist teaching organizations in our country. It is significantly atheistic in its outreach. And Dr. Habermas took a PhD there in philosophy as a Christian, but at the time he did his PhD, he was a marginal Christian to his own statement. He's developed a relatively long list of facts these facts are, are ones that can be agreed upon by Christian and non-Christian, including atheist and agnostic, of what occurred 2,000 years ago. Over the course of years, he's developed documents and sources totaling more than 3,500 Extra-biblical sources. By extra-biblical, I mean outside of this. 
I mean, I can prove to you the resurrection from this, but if your beginning point is this is not, I have to start somewhere else, don't I? He's developed over 3,500 sources outside of this to document some facts concerning the, revel- uh, the, the uh, resurrection. These facts or data points are agreed upon by a varying number of people in the scholarly world. Some facts are agreed upon by some, other facts are agreed upon by most, and then other facts are agreed upon by everyone. And he calls that the minimalist approach. What is it that we can all agree on? And let's start with our discussion there, is how he phrased it. But this morning I'd like to focus on just five facts. Five facts that are universally accepted in the scholarly world. Now, not everybody that you talk to will say, yes, I agree to that. I'm talking about scholars, Christian and non-Christian, including agnostic and atheist. Those that say there is no God and those who believe that you can't know God. They concur on these set of facts. These five facts are Jesus died by crucifixion. That is a well-documented fact, and we'll discuss that a little bit more. The disciples of Jesus were sincerely convinced that he rose from the dead and appeared to them. We have a number of extra-biblical sources that prove that to us. Paul, who was a persecutor of Christians, suddenly changed his belief towards Christianity. That also is well documented outside of the Bible. James, the brother of Jesus, who was a skeptic of the Christian faith, he didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God. He grew up with him. And no brother of his was going to be the Son of God. Suddenly changed his belief toward Christianity after the resurrection. The tomb of Jesus was found empty three days after the crucifixion of Jesus. There is a list of five universally accepted facts in the scholarly world. If you were to go down to FGCU and talk to a a credentialed history professor, they would be able to establish that these are facts that are well documented. Unless they are just so anti-Bible they won't even even accept what is documented outside of the Bible, and that is uh, certainly a possibility. These facts are almost universally agreed upon by scholars, not just Christians. These are facts that have source material outside of the Bible, outside of what we accept as God-breathed. These are facts that are outside of that purview. But let me also say, most real historians accept the word of the New Testament as a historical document. It is very difficult to challenge the history of the New Testament. We have more copies of the New Testament than we do most every historical document. And so most real historians will agree, not necessarily that what it says is is of theological nature, but it does have historical value. And so we shouldn't discount that. Anthony Flew, the late Anthony Flew, an atheist philosopher of the 20th century, he held the atheist position for most of his life. He was a friend of Dr. Habermas that we just saw. He was a philosopher that taught you have to follow the evidence. And he said, I will go where the evidence leads me to go. And late in his life, he had to admit. Now, he spent most of his life, all of his professional career, as a philosopher and as a professor, holding the atheist viewpoint. But late in his life, I think largely because of the interaction he had with Dr. Habermas, he had to conclude that God, in fact, was a reality. Now, don't get excited, I don't think... Uh, Dr. Flew became a Christian. I believe he became a deist. 
knowing that there was a God, but I don't believe he, unless very late in life, I don't believe he turned to a relationship with Jesus Christ. But Dr. Flew said, the New Testament is so valuable for us in historical references, we cannot discount what it says. I was watching a debate last week between Dr. Habermas and Dr. Flew that was recorded in uh, 2003, I think, where they were discussing the minimalist approach to the resurrection. And at one point, after Dr. Habermas had outlined these facts, he asked Dr. Flew, what would you conclude based upon these facts? Now, this was, this was prior to his, his reflection that God was real. This is while he was still an atheist. Habermas asked him, what is, your, what is your conclusion with these facts? And he said, I'm left with no choice but to either ignore the facts or to accept the resurrection. There are so many facts now, more than the five that we're going to talk about. And he said, I'm just, I'm forced to either accept the reality of the resurrection or discount what has been proven to be facts. I cannot bring myself to accept the resurrection, and so I have to discount the facts. Now, that's a remarkable statement. I am not going to accept what I have been shown and proven to be facts. My heart will not, let me, will not allow me to accept the fact that a miracle occurred. And for a while in this debate, they sat there in their chairs, and Dr. Flew was at a loss to explain it. And so he had to say the facts could not be accurate, even though they were proven, and he agreed they were proven to be accurate. He agreed to all of the facts. Dr. Habermas said, tell me a fact that is not true, that we can't substantiate outside of Scripture. And Dr. Flew could not. And yet, atheism forced him to say, I have to... To, I have to discount what I know to be true in order to accept what my heart wants me to accept. Anybody that tells you that atheism is not a religion that requires you to stand on faith is crazy. But Dr. Flew eventually came around and had to agree that God does exist. He said uh, throughout his professional career, from the very beginning of his, of his teaching career, he said, I will teach you to go where the facts lead. And eventually, he had to say, God exists. He had to admit that miracles occur because he couldn't disprove them. The facts were so strong. In addition to the historical accuracy, which Dr. Flew, as an atheist, said was true, we have at least 18 extra-biblical documents and sources for just these five facts that we're going to look at today. Not just Scripture, but what these five facts, how they're documented in various places. I agree with Dr. Habermas that there are a number of facts that are documented both in, in Scripture and out of Scripture that substantiate the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That is so well documented, most historians have to agree that it occurred. Now, they will not agree to, to the theological point of why Jesus died, and many of them refuse to accept, as Dr. Flew refused to accept, that he was resurrected from the grave but they will accept that the grave was empty and have no explanation. And remember, I'm talking about Christian scholars. I'm talking about atheist scholars, as Dr. Flew was. I'm talking about agnostic scholars. I'm talking about scholars from every kind of venue you can consider that accept the reality of these set of facts. So why am I starting here this morning? Why am I focusing on a point 
on a set of data points or on a, on a few suppositions that are based in fact here in the beginning of my message. You know that in my education, I'm a, I'm a Christian apologist. By apologist, I do not mean that I'm sorry. And a, a Christian apologist, or any apologist, is not someone that apologizes. Quite the opposite. You know that I've boldly said, I will not say I'm sorry for teaching the Word of God. I will not say I'm sorry for standing up for the authority of this book. That's what my education teaches me, to defend this book. And that's what an apologist does. My doctoral education is in Christian philosophy and apologetics. Apologetics is the branch of theology that defends the Word of God, that defends the principles of what God has said. I love to read Christian philosophers. Some of them are kind of out there. They're Christian because they're not something else, I guess, and they have some weird ideas. I, I find reading them sometimes a challenge. But I love looking at the work and the, and the, the scholarly thought of some of these uh, philosophers who are looking for ways to argue their position and defend their position as believers in Jesus Christ. One of the premier topics in apologetics, is the resurrection. You might ask, why is that? Why is it one of the things that, that is premier for us to defend? Because it is one of the things that Satan attacks. He attacks the authority of the Word of God, and he attacks the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If he can discount either of those, he can smash our faith. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is pivotal to our understanding of our theology. In fact, it is pivotal to our salvation. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're in a bad shape. If the bodily resurrection of Jesus would somehow be proven to not have occurred... Every other Christian theological construct would fail. Every other principle in theology would fail if the resurrection of Jesus Christ were proven to not be accurate. Just as important as the authority of the Word of God is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is central to the very nature of who God is. It is central to the very nature of who Jesus is. It is central to our understanding of what Jesus did on the cross. If Jesus went to the cross, died, and remained in the grave, we have nothing. The Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you still are in your sins. If Jesus remained in the grave, just expect that when you die, you have no eternity with God. It is central to what we believe. It's central to what God has done. So let me ask you a question. Why then does the world attack it? Why does Satan lead the world in attacking the resurrection? Because it's central to our salvation. And if, they can do, if the world can destroy that, then they can destroy our salvation. I had two topics in mind when I began to write my dissertation. Either the authority of the Word of God is presented in Genesis, or the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because they are central to what we understand from God. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear. Without the resurrection, you're dead in your sins. The world has gone out of its way to make Christians feel insignificant. The world goes out of its way to make you feel like you're a member of the Flat Earth Society. That you are, you are societally bankrupt. That you have no scientific skill. And that you have no rational thought ever. 
Because you believe in a resurrection and you believe in a creation by the hands of God. The world has gone out of its way to make sure that, they th that you feel like you're out of touch with reality. Christians over time have been made to give up their belief. To hold to their position. You want to hear a startling statistic? Not even 50% of people that call themselves Christians believe that Jesus physically got out of the grave. I would submit to you that they are not Christians if they don't believe Jesus was raised from the dead. Christians have been made to give up their belief in the authority of the Word of God. They've been made to give up their belief in a bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. The reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ has been attacked because Christians enjoy, and I'm going to use that term Christian for a little bit in a more looser connotation, those that attend church, let's use that, because they've enjoyed warm and fuzzy, feel-good messages, something that makes you feel good when you're here, but does nothing to teach you. They've been fed from non-confrontational pablum, and not from nice, juicy things. And so they don't know how to defend. How do you defend that Jesus bodily was resurrected from the grave? In most churches, they're not being taught the reality of that. So this morning I'd like to spend some time on five facts that are supported outside of Scripture for you to be able to defend the resurrection of Jesus Christ without laying your Bible out. Because when you begin with your Bible, the people you're talking to will discount that. We don't believe the Bible. We don't accept it to be true, so we're not going to allow you to start there. Fine, let's start with some extra-biblical sources. So let's begin with Jesus died by crucifixion. I'd venture to say most Christians believe that is a, a fact only recorded in Scripture. That there's no historical evidence for that. Of course, all four Gospels speak of the resurrection of Jesus. I'm sorry, the crucifixion of Jesus. It is a, it is a central part of the, of the narrative that progresses in the four Gospels. It is the climax in many ways of each of the four Gospels. But you know, that's not the only place we read it. Flavius Josephus records about the resurrection. If uh, any of you watched the, the Dove Keepers this past week, you were introduced a little bit more to Flavius Josephus. He was uh, the guy at the beginning that came out to interview the, the two uh, ladies. And he was the guy at the end that released them. Flavius Josephus was a... A Roman general, I'm sorry, a uh, Jewish general uh, after the time of Christ who became a Roman turncoat, essentially a Roman spy, and then became a Roman historian. In many ways, Josephus recorded for us things that have substantiated Scripture. And in other ways, Josephus was not a great numbers guy. He often got numbers wrong. But he records for us in, uh, in his book, The Antiquity of the Jews. He says, Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. That is a remarkable statement. A teacher of, the man, or of men who receive the truth with pleasure. I hope that's us. He drew over to him both many Jews and many Gentiles. He was the Christ. By that, he means he was the Messiah. Even though he was Jewish, he was writing in Greek, and Christus is, uh, is the, the same word as Messiah, the Hebrew Messiah. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross... 
Those that loved him at first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive the third day, as divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians so named for him are not extinct to this day. Now, Josephus was by no means a Christian. In the Dove Keepers, they played that role pretty, pretty good, where he was anti Jew, or at least anti Jewish theology, and later he was anti Christian. As a Jewish general who became a spy for the Romans, he was not trusted by the Romans, but was hated by the Jews. And he was by no means a Christian. So when he talks about the resurrection of the crucifixion and then the resurrection of Jesus and the appearances of Jesus, he's not talking from a theological point of view. He's not making the case because of some love of Jesus. He's recording the facts. And because there are not a lot of numbers involved, they're pretty accurate facts. You have to question when Josephus starts talking about numbers. You have to question whether he gets the numbers right. But these set of facts, he's pretty, pretty accurate on. So we have one extra biblical, well-documented source. You can, you can go online and download for free the, the works of Josephus translated into English. It's difficult reading, but it is, uh, it is interesting to see what he had to say. But Josephus is not the only source. Tacitus was a Roman senator and a historian who wrote concerning the resurrection. Pay attention to what he says. He says, Nero fastened the guilt of the burning of Rome and inflicted the most exquisite torture on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, for whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of the procreators, Pontius Pilate. So he doesn't explicitly say crucified, he calls it extreme penalty. The one for whom Christians are named suffered the extreme penalty under Pontius Pilate. Now, notice that Tacitus is quoting or alleging the thoughts of Nero. Nero, the emperor who burned most of Rome and blamed the Christians for it. In that same sentence, Tacitus says that Jesus was crucified. By the way, we have recordings of Nero also saying that. But lest you believe that that's all we have, Lucian of uh, Samosta, a Greek satirist. Now, uh, we would have them on late night TV today. He made fun of, of things that were going on in society. But his other job, his daytime job, if you will, was what we would call an attorney today. Uh, he didn't defend people in court. He pled for them in court. And that was an art form in Greek and Roman courts, a court pleader. He was also a, a historian, certainly not a Christian. Matter of fact, most of his writings are anti Christian. He was not sym sympathetic to Christian, Christians and Christian views. He writes, the Christians you, now, you know worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. So you have a late night TV host speaking about the crucifixion of Jesus. I could go on and on and on about sources outside of the Bible that talk about Jesus Christ being crucified. We have extensive early church writings outside of the Bible, but certainly from the Christian domain. Disciples of the apostles. And the next generation who were writing, talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. 
the historic reality to the life and death of Jesus is not challenged by most historians unless they just ignore the facts. And most historians try not to do that. It's a well-documented fact. Jesus died by crucifixion. Crucifixion is well-established as a Roman method of uh, crucifixion. It is well-documented that it was used. We have records that on some days Pontius Pilate had ordered the the crucifixion of more than 2,000 people in one day. We have these documents. We, We know these facts to be true. And Jesus was one of the ones executed at the hand of Pontius Pilate using Roman crucifixion. We also have documents, primarily through their own testimony, that the disciples of Jesus were convinced that Jesus rose from, rose from the dead and appeared to them. We have those, those testimonies in Scripture. Their lives were changed and their behavior was completely different than it was prior to his death. Remember what it was prior to the cross? Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when Judas led them to arrest Jesus? Peter, who had just had his feet washed by Jesus, was ready to defend Jesus. And he whips out his sword and he goes to cut the head off of the high priest's servant. Peter's not a great swordsman, he's a fisherman. And he whacks off his ear. And Jesus, down. I, I, I can't wait to be able to see the, the HD version of this. Jesus reaches down and picks up the ear and I imagine cleans it off and puts it back on and it's healed. And Jesus tells Peter, put your sword away. And then he's arrested and taken into custody. And all the other disciples, what do they do? They follow after and they're close intent, right? No, they scatter. Not a single one of them follows closely. Not a single one of them except John is present at the crucifixion. They're watching from afar. Peter, even though he was bold and ready to whack off the ear, or the head, and gets in the ear, just a couple hours later, he cusses out a little girl who said, didn't I see you with Jesus? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think I did. I don't. And he cussed her out. No longer was he there ready to defend. He didn't want it. Jesus is arrested. It's over. I'm done. That's where Peter was. That's the way it was before the cross. That's the way it was after the cross. What did they do after the cross? They went into hiding. But then, Sunday morning, the ladies go and find the grave open. And we have varying accounts that we've all read several times about Jesus appearing to, to various people including Peter and John and the ladies and all the disciples. And Paul records that at one point he reappeared to more than 500 at once. After he appeared to them, there were things that changed in their life. A few weeks later, after cussing out the little girl, no, I don't, I don't even know him, I've never seen him, Peter's standing on the, on the steps of the temple and is defying the, the civil authorities and says, listen to me, people. He was raised from the grave. I've talked to him. I spent time with him. He defied them when he was told, don't preach in his name. Well, you just do whatever you got to do, Mr. Policeman. But as for me and the disciples, we've got to do what we've got to do, and we've got to preach the word of God. Went from a guy cussing out a little girl to a guy defending the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, what changes a man like that? What changes when that happens? The disciples were sincerely convinced that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Consider also, and we'll talk about him in a little bit, the Apostle Paul. 
I think the Apostle Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. He certainly was a member of the Pharisees. We know that. And he eventually got orders. This is after the, the resurrection. He got orders from the chief priest. Here are your warrants. You go out and arrest them, and if you have to, kill them. Wanted dead or alive Christians. Until one day, the resurrected Jesus appears to Paul on the road to Damascus. And his life was dramatically changed. He went from persecuting the church to defending the church. Preaching about the blasphemy of the resurrection to preaching about the reality of the resurrection. How does a man so high up in the Jewish faith change so rapidly? What changes when that occurs? Of course, we've already talked about Peter and how he's changed. And the early church who was willing to suffer for their beliefs. You know, the early church was not as accepted as even as we are today. They were rejected by their Jewish families. They were rejected by society. They were rejected by the Jewish aristocracy, those that led in the temple. They were rejected by Rome because they were teaching an adherence to a king other than Caesar. They had no friends anywhere. They were persecuted by everyone. Why? Because they taught the resurrection and they lived and they died teaching the resurrection. We have hundreds of writings in the first generation of the church, of disciples and apostles attesting to the growth of the church based upon the belief of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Almost every religion that, that people came out of to be Christian had a special worship day on Saturday. But the church was worshiping on Sunday. What changed with them? It was an understanding of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which, which occurred on a Sunday. For 200 years after the resurrection, the church grew rapidly but suffered mightily because of their adherence to the resurrection. Because they taught Jesus came out of the grave. We have that well documented. We have hundreds of documents of the early church teaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And history clearly teaches that the church was oppressed by the Jews and by the Romans. Remember, it was Christians that provided the light for the Colosseum in Rome. And I don't mean they turned the light bulbs on. I mean that their bodies were impaled on stakes and they were covered in tar and lit on fire. So that other Christians could stand up to the lion as the Romans bet on them. That's what being a Christian meant then. You were going to be attacked by your family and by Rome. And yet they died teaching that, Ro that Jesus rose from the dead. I would submit that kind of dedication is not for a conspiracy. It is not for something other than something you know to be true because you saw the physical resurrection of Jesus. We've talked about Paul. Persecutor of Christians suddenly changed his belief toward Christianity. Paul documents his own conversion, as does Dr. Luke in the book of Acts. Even skeptics and atheists accept that Paul, or if you will, Saul of Tarsus, had a conversion. That's well documented in Scripture. But in addition to biblical sources, we, we have Clement of Rome in his epistle to the Corinthians documenting Paul's conversion. We have Ignatius of Antioch in his letter to the Romans documenting Paul's conversion. We have Polycarp's letter to the Philippians documenting the conversion of Paul. In the century, second century, a uh, biography of uh, Polycarp, a document called The Martyrdom of Polycarp, we have documented the conversion of Paul. 
Now, these are early church documents, granted, but they're not biblical. They're not part of Scripture. They are well-documented, attested sources that we have that historically reflect the change of Paul's life. There, there are some references to Paul's conversion even in Jewish literature. Because he was such a high-standing moral character in Judaism that when he became a Christian, they thought, what's going on? And we have documents that attest to that. Paul's life dramatically changed when he came face to face with the risen Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. James, the brother of Jesus. Now, can you imagine growing up as the younger brother of Jesus? That's... Sometimes I wonder, why did God have Jesus have brothers and sisters? Because for them, life was not pleasant. Can you imagine having a, an older sibling that's perfect? Come on! That's just not right. But, and they responded exactly like that. None of them accepted Jesus as the Messiah until after they saw the resurrected Jesus. Okay, he's a good guy, but he's not God. He's my brother. And I know my character, so he can't be God. Can't you just see that? John teaches us that none of his brothers accepted him. John says in John chapter 5, 7 verse 5, for not even his brothers believed him. Now, you're, you're not a great preacher if you can't even win your own family. I mean, that's just the way it is, right? We only have scripture to establish that his family rejected him. There's very little challenge to the fact. We have extra biblical sources in their post-conversion, but we only have scripture that tell us that they didn't believe beforehand. So these are, this is one of the facts that is going to be a little bit less universally accepted because we don't have a document that says beforehand they didn't believe. Following the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, things changed for James. When he came face to face with his risen older brother, who he saw on the cross, he had to conclude, he is different than me. I mean, before he was just perfect. Now he's God. And James died a martyr. James was executed for teaching that Jesus rose from the grave. He became one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And at the time, as we see in Acts chapter 15, the church in Jerusalem was kind of calling the shots for everyone. And he was one of the leaders of that movement. Both Josephus and Clement of Rome document that James the Lord's brother was executed for his belief and following of Jesus. He was transformed by the power of the resurrection. And there's no real challenge to that fact. Now the fifth fact. The tomb of Jesus was found empty three days after the crucifixion of Jesus. This fact is attested to by the majority of the New Testament writers. Dr. Habermas, who has studied the resurrection for the, his entire professional career, has documented more than 75% of the scholars that deal with this period of time in history Christian and non-Christian, more than 75% agree the grave was empty. That's pretty good. You can't get 75% of anybody to agree on anything. So if 75% of the, of the first century scholars say that Jesus' grave was empty, we've got to come up with an explanation. Jesus died on the cross sometime on Friday, late in the afternoon on Friday. Early enough, though, to allow for his body to be removed from the cross 
prior to be the, the beginning of the Sabbath, which was at sundown Friday. For argument's sake, let's say 6 p.m. on Friday. So sometime between 3 and 6, Jesus is dead and his body is removed from the, from the cross. And he is placed in a grave very close, into a tomb very close to the, to the cross. A newly dug grave or, or tomb owned by Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, who was a secret follower of Jesus. He approached Pilate and said, I want his body. And so his body was removed and enough, there was enough time for them to wrap him, but not completely prepare him for, for interment in, the, in the, the grave. Then on Sunday morning, it was discovered the grave was empty. We have varying accounts of who got there and why and when. The ladies got there and they discovered the tomb was empty. The disciples got there and discovered the tomb was empty. And we now have a mystery. And then Jesus began to appear to the various people. Without saying how it became empty... The majority of historians and scholars agree that it was empty. Again, more than 5%. And there are three rationales used for the grave being empty. The Jerusalem factor, and I'll explain that. Enemy attestation, and the testimony of the women. Now, what's the Jerusalem factor? Most historians agree that if disciples were going to set up a story about the resurrection of Jesus, Jerusalem would not be the place to do it. If they were going to set up a story of Jesus being raised from the dead by stealing his body, they wouldn't remain in Jerusalem for more than 50 days after to begin teaching that. They were mostly Galileans. If I were going to tell a story about Jesus being raised from the grave in Jerusalem, I'd go to Galilee. So the people hearing me would not be able to walk down the street to the tomb and look, is it empty? No, there are the bones. Okay, no story. Nothing to see here, move on. But what do they do? They start teaching in Jerusalem. They start preaching that Jesus was raised from the dead in Jerusalem. People could walk down the street, go to the... Wow, the grave's empty. Maybe there is something to this story. The Jerusalem factor. Why would you do it in Jerusalem? You'd do it somewhere else where, where you couldn't be immediately disproven. But in Jerusalem, they could be. The enemy attestation. In Matthew chapter 28... We read, and when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers. And they said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him while we were asleep. And I want you to think about this for a minute. If Jesus' body was still in the grave, why did they have to concoct this story? The fact is, the grave was empty. They had to explain it. Now the guards on the tomb were both Roman and Jewish. They were Roman soldiers and they were, they were uh, Jewish temple guards. Both of whom could suffer serious penalty. For the Roman soldiers, if they fell asleep on their, on their post, it could mean execution. So they are being told... Listen, we'll square it with your bosses and we'll pay you some money for you to shut up. You just say you fell asleep and the disciples came and stole the body. They had to come up with some plausible way for the body to be gone and the grave to be empty. That only can tell me that the grave actually was empty. Because if it was not empty, it's the perfect solution to their problem. The disciples are there in Jerusalem teaching that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, it's easy to prove that that's not true. Come on, people, let's go to the grave. See? Empty. No, I'm, so, I'm sorry. There they are laying. There are the bones. See? He didn't rise from the dead. It's right there. 
Story is over. Christianity falls. Nothing happens. We never learn of Paul. We never learn of Peter. We never learn of the change in James. If the bones are there, it's done. So why pay money? Why risk ex execution of themselves? It's because the grave was empty. They had to do something. The Sanhedrin had to do something. We have to prove the grave was empty because the body was stolen. We have to explain it somehow. Then we have the testimony of the women. Some of you, I'm sorry, will be offended by this, but in both Jewish and Roman circles, women were not allowed to testify in court. There's some argument why. One scholar says because they can't be counted, to tell, counted on to tell the truth. But another scholar says it's because they can't be counted on to lie when necessary. So, the, the reality is, women were not allowed to testify in court. If you had a matter and your only witness was a woman, too bad for you. You can't, you, women didn't testify in court. If I were the disciples and I were concocting this story about the resurrection of Jesus, would I, would I make women my primary testimony? No. I would make some important men. Joseph of Arimathea would come to mind because he was, a, he was a secret follower of Jesus. And he came out of the closet at the death of Jesus and said, let me have his body. I'd use him. He was well respected. He was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin. So he could, he could stand up and, and give some legitimacy. I wouldn't use women. And think about the women. Who are the women? One of them was a former prostitute. Would that be your star witness? I worked in the prosecutor's office for three years. We vetted a lot of people. We always looked at their background. What's going to come back to haunt us when we put them on the stand? Prostitute, not a good witness. So does that make sense? The disciples would go through all of that using witnesses that couldn't be counted on or that wouldn't be accepted? In a place where they're where their word could be challenged immediately, makes no sense at all. But that's a common theory, that the disciples stole the body. Well, then produce the body. Rome ruled. They had more soldiers there than they knew what to do with. They could have found the body. But there's no, there's no documentation of a body being found. We have no evidence that a body was ever found. We have empty graves, but no, nothing identified as Jesus. Now, in, years, in recent years, we have several guys that have come up and said, we have now found the grave of Jesus, and guess what we found in there? We found bones. And one was determined to be a 5th century grave, not a 1st century grave. One was determined to be, through DNA studies, to be somebody that was not of Jewish origin at all. I mean, so everything that has been posted recently as the grave of Jesus has been discounted. We have no body, we have no grave. We have empty tombs, but nothing that tells us where he is. So what's the conclusion? These five facts are universally accepted. You can go to have a discussion with any serious student. Anybody that's willing to say, yes, this is what history says. I might remind you that we have more attestation for the, resurrect, for the death of Jesus and an empty grave than we do for George Washington crossing the Delaware, than we do for the names on the, on the document we call the Declaration of Independence, how they got there. We universally accept that truth that George Washington crossed the Delaware and that we have those names on the Declaration of Independence. But we have more facts that line up that Jesus died on the cross and the grave was empty. In philosophical circles, we have a logic tool called Occam's Razor. Now, I'm not going to get all, all theoretical on you and, and so forth, but 
Occam's razor is a, is a tool you'll hear discussed once in a while. Essentially, Occam's razor says, other, thi all, other things being equal, simpler explanations are generally better than more complex ones. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a loose understanding of what Occam's razor says in, in logic. If you have a set of facts, what's the easiest, most simplest explanation for those set of, set of facts? That's essentially what Occam's razor says. You take the simplest as being the most likely. Every time you add something to those facts that makes it more complex, you have, you have distorted and potentially changed the answer. With Occam's razor as a tool, Anthony Flew, famed atheist, was forced to say the facts substantiate Jesus was raised from the dead. Now remember, he was not a Christian. I don't believe he ever became a Christian. I believe at the best he became a deist, believing there was a God. Or some kind of, of supernatural force. So for him, while he's still an atheist, to conclude the facts substantiate Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Now, not everybody's going to come to that conclusion. But like he said... I can't accept those facts because my heart won't let me. The simplest explanation for the facts that we know are that Jesus was raised from the dead. But atheists don't want to accept that. We've showed that Jesus was crucified. We've showed that his resurrection made a dramatic impact on the lives of people. And we've showed that the grave was empty. And the conclusion that Occam's razor would say is, he was resurrected from the dead. Now, think about the conspiracy angle. Some people argue, well, there was a conspiracy. That the, the, the disciples conspired together to steal the body of Jesus. When I, when I was in the state attorney's office, we, we did a lot of investigation of racketeering cases, RICO cases, conspiracy cases. Conspiracies of more than one always break down. Somebody gives up eventually. Now, how many, how many actors were in this conspiracy if the New Testament accounts are accurate? And they are. At least 500, because Jesus appeared to more than 500 on one occasion. So we have the 12, minus Judas, plus Matthias, the 12. We have Paul, we have James, we have the more than 500. That's a big conspiracy. And every one of them, except John, the only disciple not to be martyred was John, and it wasn't because they didn't try. They tried on multiple occasions to kill John. He just wouldn't die. I mean, they boiled the guy in oil. And he didn't die. All the rest died maintaining the conspiracy. Jesus was resurrected and we have seen him. That doesn't work in real life. Because on the deathbed, the conspiracy always breaks. People always want to come clean or to provide themselves a pass. You know, you watch cop shows on TV. You play two parts of a conspiracy against each other. The first person to give me a deal gets a break, or give me the truth gets a break. I've done that. I've gotten confessions that way. I know that you and he were together in this. You give me the information, and I'll give you a deal, and we'll hang it on him. Conspiracy always falls apart. Why would we think that this conspiracy wouldn't? We can't think that because that's against human nature. The conspiracies of more than one always fall apart. But consider Paul and James. They could not have been part of the conspiracy unless they were convinced later on. Paul fought the church. James didn't like the fact that he had a perfect older brother. So how were they brought into conspiracy? 
They'd have been the perfect ones to say that it didn't happen. And yet they were brought in somehow. There's no conspiracy. You couldn't, you couldn't establish in court a conspiracy with those people. Does it take faith to believe that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins? Sure, it takes faith. But remember what we saw in 1 Timothy a few weeks ago? Where does that faith come from? Because of God's mercy, he gave us grace. And because of God's grace, he gave us faith to believe that Jesus died on the cross. As Dr. Flew pointed out, it takes faith to not believe Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected from the grave. What takes more faith? To believe that Jesus wasn't resurrected or that Jesus was resurrected? The facts support the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The facts support that he walked out of the grave and that he appeared to more than 500 people, of which we have documents of. The Apostle Peter says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Here's the important part. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Why does it matter that Jesus walked out of the grave, was resurrected? Because it is central to the core of our theology, and we are responsible to defend it. And I venture to say that in most churches, that's not what they're being told. They're not being told to defend it. Peter said, defend it. Understand how to defend it. He was buried in a grave until he walked out of the grave on Sunday morning. He was raised in a new glorified body and then it was called the first fruit of the resurrection. He was the first one to be in that glorified body. We someday too will be in that glorified body where we'll be able to transcend time and space. We've explored common grounds between atheists and Christians this morning. We've explored where you can lay out for the, for the non-believer and not start with your Bible, although the Bible is, is the most important document we could ever have. But remember, the atheist is not going to accept this. So start from a position that they can accept, like the debate between Habermas and Flu. The facts that were sufficient to cause the atheist Tony Flew to say, I conclude those facts support the resurrection of Jesus. My faith won't allow me to accept it. You have common ground that you can start with in a discussion. Subsequent to that debate, he did recognize the reality of a God. I hope when I get to heaven, Tony Flew is there. That not only did he recognize that there was a supernatural being, but that Gary Habermas was able to lead him to the Lord. They were close friends. They debated across the country many times. And Flew stayed in, Tony's uh, uh, in uh, Gary's house many times. And Gary stayed in Tony's house many times. I hope that Flew was led to the Lord and before he died he accepted the reality of Jesus Christ. He knew the truth. He just had to accept it. We need to stand ready to defend it. Anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that's in you. What's your hope? On this resurrection Sunday morning, we have hope. We have hope that we will spend eternity with God. The world has no hope. It's going to hell in a handbasket. True saying, saying. There are people that have rejected the word of God. They have rejected the truth of Jesus Christ's resurrection. They've rejected the reality that Jesus died on the cross for them. And they're going to die and be in hell. And it's our job to defend what God has said. What's the hope that's in you? My hope is that when I die, I'm with Jesus. And remember, hope does not mean, well... That's what I think is going to happen. 
This is the biblical understanding, the surety of what God has said will happen. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To be in eternity. Now, most of you know that it wasn't that long ago that I thought that's where I was going to be relatively quickly. There were times that I thought, okay, it's time. I'm, I'm, the next thing I wake up to will be heaven. That was a big consolation to me. I don't think my wife kind of liked that idea a whole lot. but To be absent from the body and to be present with Jesus Christ, that is a great hope. It is a reality of where we'll be if we know Jesus Christ. If we accept the reality of his death on the cross, his substitutionary death for us. Chuck said earlier that on Jesus' mind when he went to the cross was our names. Every one of us. Think about the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was praying. He told the disciples, you stay over there. And he took a few more and he went a little further. He said, you stay here and watch and pray. Then he went a little further. And he prayed. And he sweat drops of blood in the agony of what was coming. Thinking about the pain of bearing my sin on his back. His entire life was focused on that moment. And he said, Father, if possible, let this pass from me. And in reality set in, nevertheless, Father, not my will, but yours. I'm here to do this for you. And he was thinking about me. He was thinking about you. And then he died on the cross. And as he was hanging there before he died in agony, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As my sin impacted him. And then he said, finally, tetelestai, it is finished. What God had planned before he created was finished. Salvation for us was won. And then he bowed his head and he died. And when Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate to ask for his body, well, is he dead already? It was amazing that he was dead that soon. One of the Roman soldiers stuck a spear in his chest and out came water and blood, an indication that he was dead. There was no heart pumping. And they took him down and put him in a grave. That was Friday. It was dark. Remember, 3 o'clock, he died. It got dark. It got pitch black. It's dark on Friday. Sunday's coming. Sunday morning at sunrise, there the ladies see him. Resurrected. Because he conquered death. Oh, death, where is your sting? Where is your victory, Paul says. Jesus conquered death for us. Paid the price for us so that we can have hope for our future. And that is that we too will be resurrected or transformed. If Jesus comes before we die, we just go from this mortal body to the glorified body in an instant. I kind of want that to happen rather than dying, but I'm ready to die too. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I'm looking forward to that. And I pray that you are as well. Father, we love you. And we are so grateful for the picture that you have painted for us in your word. Father, I'm also grateful that a number of, of people have documented outside of your word, that not that your word needs to be corroborated, because we trust it and we believe it, but there, as you know, Father, there are many that don't. And so we're able to show them that there are reasons to believe that Jesus died on the cross and that the grave was empty. And the best explanation for that is that he was resurrected from the grave. Thank you, Father, for earning my salvation through the death of your son. As a dad, I couldn't sacrifice my child for anyone, let alone for people that don't love me. In fact, people that are my enemies, I, I couldn't do that. But you graciously did that for us. And so we're grateful. We're grateful for the fact that we now have a relationship with you. And that that relationship means that we are forever yours. 
and will spend eternity with you. Thank you for that. We love you and we want to serve you and we want to honor you and we want to glorify you. Thank you for sending your son to die. Thank you for calling him out of the grave, victorious over death, victorious over sin. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching this Sermon on Demand at Friendship Community Church. If this message has been helpful to you in your understanding of the Word of God, please let folks at Friendship Community Church know by sending an email to watching at friendshipcomchurch.org. Thank you again for watching, and we look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Community Church.